The creation of the European External Action Service offers opportunities to improve the EU's overall crisis response through actions under the instrument for stability. The joint situation centre that has been placed within the EEAS is to provide the Council with high quality information on matters of public security in the, in the form of early warnings, assessment and services in case of emergency. An EU CPRN action plan should make for the efficient interaction of national and EU initiatives in addressing CPRN risks and in preparing the necessary responses. It should enhance both horizontal coordination between the Commission and Member States and vertical coordination between the EU level and Member States instruments. An EU CPRN action plan is divided into three main parts. First, prevention, second, detection, and third, preparedness and response. Welcome. And it also includes a fourth chapter on actions applicable to CPRN prevention and response. I believe that recognizing the importance of each of these stages is crucial to ensure proper implementation of risk assessment studies, responses and countermeasures. Ladies and gentlemen, in recent years, the number of major natural and man-made disasters occurring in the world has increased. Although the EU's disaster readiness has increased since the establishment of the EU's civil protection mechanism in 2001, much still remains to be done in order to bring about coordinated, consistent and high-profile EU measures. Therefore, I would like to stress the importance of the urgent establishment of a European Civil Protection Force based on the existing EU Civil Protection Mechanism. With the aid of such a force, the EU should be able to bring together the resources necessary for providing emergency assistance within 24 hours of a CPRN disaster inside or outside EU territory. In addition for European civilian civil protection force, I would call for the urgent establishment of a European crisis response mechanism that should coordinate civilian and military means so as to ensure that the EU has a rapid response capability to deal with a CPRN disaster. Finally, I would like to stress that the fight against terrorism must be conducted with full respect of international human rights law and European fundamental rights law principles and values, including the principle of the rule of law. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to host this ALDE seminar with, with a good colleague of mine, Mrs. Vilja Savisar Tonas. And uh, you all know that she comes from Estonia. And uh, I would like to tell that there are many people that have been working very hard in order to organize that seminar. And I would like to thank all of them for the great work they have done. Additionally, I would especially like to thank Dr. Timo Hellenberg 
leader of the EU each project and also his whole team. Without the magnificent work that you have done, this seminar <coughs> wouldn't have been possible. And now I would like to give the floor to the first speaker, uh, Mr. Dick Heymans, who is head of the counterterrorism sector in the European Commission. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and obviously I'm very pleased to be here and to be able to contribute on behalf of the Commission to, uh, to this event, which I think is going to be particularly interesting and relevant for all of us. Um, the first point which I guess makes this particular event special is that it is a very good example of public-private partnership. If you look at the exercises which have been uh, taken part and if you look at the way that this has been organized, you will see that this is one of those areas where public authorities cannot really guarantee security without working with private authorities. In this case, for example, the uh, airport authorities and the authorities which run the uh, civilian airlines. Um, I think this is very important and this is also one of the main policy themes that we uh, embrace at the European Commission in, in implementing our counterterrorism policies and in general in implementing the uh, internal security strategy. The second special feature I think of this particular project is that it goes beyond the member states of the European Union. There has been cooperation from Hong Kong, there's been cooperation, I understand, also with, uh, with the Russian authorities. Um, all of these make this uh, a really, really special project. Uh, <clears throat> there are, of course, a number of European exercises in this field which take place every year, but these are normally limited to EU member states only. And I think it is only through these sorts of exercises with international partners that we really and truly will understand what the challenges are in cases uh, something like this uh, happens in real life. Now, the third point which makes this conference and this event particularly interesting for us is the fact that it focuses on CBRN materials. Madam Chair, you already referred, of course, to the EU CBRN action plan. Um, this was based on a proposal from the Commission adopted by the Council. We are now very pleased, of course, also to see the um, resolution from the European Parliament on this point. And we'll be, of course, working together with Parliament in the implementation also of this project. But also in this EU CBRN action plan, you will see that there is a focus on training and exercises. Indeed, it is recognized that without training and exercises, it will not be possible to be as prepared as we need to be. Um, so this key action, um, training exercises, is of course very well exemplified by this particular project. And then one final point which is of relevance to us, of course, was the focus on aviation security. And I don't think I need to remind everyone about the vulnerability of our aviation to terrorist attacks. We've been reminded recently, of course, by the attack at the Moscow airport. But there have been other incidents, the, uh, the explosives in the printer cartridges, uh, the underpants bomber, um, and so on and so forth. So all of these elements um, combined really demonstrate that this is a project which is of great interest to the European Commission, to the implementation of uh, policies on CBRN, and therefore we've been very happy to be associated with it and also, of course, to fund it. In conclusion, I think we all know that, unfortunately, we live in a dangerous world and we need to be prepared for these low, pro low probability but very high risk events. Um, I think that we cannot do that without being as prepared as we can be and we cannot be prepared without exercising, training, finding out whether the plans that we have put in place will actually work in practice and I think this project and also this seminar will help us in take this work forward. Thank you very much. Thanks. Mr. Dick Hemans, and now we continue our open remarks, and the following speaker will be Johnny Engel Hansen, Head of Operation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to um, the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe for organizing this um, important conference. And thank you to Timo Hellenberg for inviting the Situation Centre and myself to Helsinki to attend uh, the practical exercise in October last year with the most interesting experience. Um, the Situation Centre works on a horizontal global level and not particularly in the uh, CBRN area. So my intervention will focus on the general uh, crisis handling on, in the EU at, at this policy level. I would also like to say that views and suggestions that I express, they are personal and they are my own and not necessarily reflecting an official position that will enable me to speak a little bit more freely. 
And with that caveat, I, I'd like to share with you the synthesis of problems that we have hitherto encountered in the framework of EU crisis handling at the political level, drawing all the lessons that we have had in this respect from my vantage point as Head of Operations Unit in the EU Situation Centre over the past seven years. The basic premises, I think, is that the EU was originally conceived to do policy making and response in a matter of uh, months and years. And experience have taught member states and EU institutions the hard way that in a serious crisis situation, such lengthy, complex procedures are inadequate. That in such a crisis situation, the EU must be able to, uh, to, to undertake policy consultations and policy coordination in a matter of hours and days. Already from its inception in 2006, the so-called EU Emergency and Crisis Coordination Arrangements, which are normally known under the acronym CCA, they were aimed at addressing uh, this need by establishing political coordination procedures at EU level that precisely allowed member states to respond to major crisis situations without having to go through normal council working procedures which in itself has created problems, and I'll come back to that later. The current state of affairs, I say the very real-life crisis situation that we have experienced, such as the Haiti earthquake in January last year, or in Egypt in these uh, very days, they serve to illustrate just how complex most serious crises really are. Now, Haiti may have been a calamitous natural disaster, requiring first and foremost humanitarian assistance, but it also had instant implications in terms of civil protection, security, defense, foreign policy, consular aid, etc., etc. And that, I think, is a lesson learned that almost any crisis will, in fact, require the urgent attention of senior officials and policymakers across many different policy sector areas in the EU provided that the event is sufficiently big enough. The determining factor is not, is less the subject matter of such an event than its seriousness and its possible political implications. So in other words, if it's big enough, it's political. Member States have no common shared understanding of what kind of crisis requires triggering of the special crisis coordination arrangements. It's the prevailing perception among some member states that crisis arrangements should only be used in the really catastrophic extreme situations, whereas other member states think that the arrangement could also be successfully used for responding to less dramatic crises, which might benefit from cross-sector information exchange and policy considerations at the horizontal EU level. Also, among EU institutions, there are currently no single view as to how and when crisis procedures like the CCA should kick in. These divergencies of views uh, could lead some to think that the crisis coordination arrangements, as they are currently designed, do not really provide member states with the necessary tools for political consultations and coordinations at EU level in a crisis situation. I would argue, though, that these arrangements should be considered work in progress. What is agreed by all member states and EU institutions, I think, is that there, there are and there always will be exceptional circumstances that do require the EU to respond quickly and coherently and where political coordinations at EU level is a must. So the ability, on the one hand, to quickly draw together and maintain a comprehensive across-the-board situation overview and, on the other hand, to be able to elaborate uh, cross-policy areas, coherent uh, response options for the EU level, that will be key to a concerted and coordinated uh, crisis handling at the EU level. And if I may go into a little bit more detail of the um, lessons learned or where we have had uh, complications, uh, I think the empirical evidence board broadly demonstrated that we have challenges in three different areas. We have between EU institutions, in the past, the Council Secretariat and the Commission. We have uh, at member states level between member states in their permanent representations and member states in their capitals. And we have some challenges in the relationship between EU institutions and member states. So. Um, if you allow, I'll go a little bit more into detail in all these areas. 
First, between the Commission and the Council Secretariat. I think the original setup adopted by the Council envisaged that the Council and the uh, Commission would get together in a, in a pre crisis situation and establish a sort of a joint ad hoc crisis secretariat, a support machinery uh, that was intended to serve uh, and report to a senior uh, level officials support group. Uh, this support machinery main task was intended to draw together the comprehensive situation overview and make this available. But as of today, this has not materialized, neither in the context of exercises or in real crisis. And the main reason has been reservations on part of the Commission to such modo operandi. Are there good reasons for that? And um, we'll come back to that later if we want. Um, the creation now of the External Action Service, to which the Situation Centre is now part, adds a third institution to this interinstitutional equation and thus potentially multiplies complexity. So there is a need anyway to revisit the support machinery part of crisis handling concept with a view to either implementing it as initially envisaged or to modify it to really correspond to the political reality of the actual interinstitutional relationship. Either way, I think it should be a sine qua non that EU institutions cooperate and coordinate closely in order to provide policymakers with one single and uniform situation overview and consequence analysis throughout any serious crisis situation affecting the EU. Member states and uh, in capitals and in perm reps, and here I'm a little bit on perhaps on thin ground because I'm not part of the member states, but anyway, I'll, I'll dare uh, say a few words on that. Uh, from its adoption, it was clear that member states wanted the crisis coordination uh, to take place at the EU level. It was a Brussels thing, so we were obliged to interact with permanent representations and not with capitals. This has uh, proved to be a bottleneck. Um, many member states do not have the necessary resources at the permanent representations here in Brussels to be able to engage in a crisis mode in the two hours that we have been given as a deadline for setting up and moving to crisis coordination arrangements mode of handling things. As a consequence, member states themselves have had a tendency to increasingly bypass the permanent representations and deal directly with situation center EU institutions in crisis situations. And this tendency is, of course, further underscored by the legal obligation that many uh, member states have to provide input, the sector-specific input uh, to the many rapid alert systems that is operating by the Commission. And furthermore, member states have also, in recent years, more and more member states have established single overarching national crisis centres. In this context, I think EU institution member states might find it useful to distinguish between policy making and situational awareness. I think when we come to situational awareness, there should be no restriction of the flow from information from national to central point, whereas it's clear that policy making should go uh, through uh, member states' capitals, perm reps, and council, etc., as a normal procedure. Um, third point is uh, the relationship between member states and EU institutions. There is no denying that um, crisis coordination, working relationship between member states and EU institutions has been a challenge. There are many reasons, but I think the overriding is that the special crisis coordination arrangements by design differ from normal council proceedings. And uh, they were deliberately designed to do so in order to short shortcut or short circuit these normal working procedures to be faster. However, there has, alas, a shared understanding of this crisis modus operandi has, has not evolved. And this is probably due to the fact that the crisis coordination arrangements are rarely used on the one hand, and the other hand, that there is a rotating EU presidency every six months. So they never really get to get used to it before the next one takes over. Um, overcoming these inherent difficult challenges will not be easy. I think the crisis management procedures will have to be made more flexible and adapted to ensure that uh, crisis response structures within EU institutions, they carry a bigger burden from an organizational and executive perspective while at the same time ensuring that the EU presidency maintain policy levels. There is, of course, also the possibility 
that uh, uh, these crisis uh, arrangements could be conferred on one uh, permanent EU crisis chairperson. It's not easy to see, however, how the EU could agree on such an arrangement. Now, some pointers regarding future EU crisis handling. Um, I think on the one hand, the post-Lisbon legal institutional framework adds additional complexity to Brussels, in particular with the arrival of the High Representative and her External Action Service and the President of the European Council. On the other hand, this may be the opportunity to consider a new, a possible setup that would align thinking and actions by all member states and EU institutions in a crisis situation. And I think in this context, it may be worthwhile thinking also what role the European Parliament uh, should play, both in establishing such arrangements and in the handling of an actual crisis situation. Now, whichever set of arrangement is ultimately chosen at EU level, it would be of paramount, paramount importance that all sectoral policy components work together in a seamless manner. And to this end, I would argue that the EU needs one single unified crisis response platform covering all EU institutions and the ability to integrate all policy areas. Coherent, consistent and vigorous policy action at the EU level in a crisis situation will likely be facilitated if these actions are perceived to represent the shared views and interests of all member states and all EU institutions. However, as I said earlier, it is impractical to elaborate EU policy level crisis response through normal council proceedings. And to square this circle, you could consider to create some sort of an EU supreme crisis board. It's composed of the EU presidency, the president of the European Council, the president of the Commission, and the EU high representative. And to this, you might add some role to the European Parliament. The role of the Supreme Crisis Board, it could be defined as ensuring overall institutional coherency between all EU crisis response instruments and crisis response policies pursued. The Supreme Crisis Board should align and synchronize crisis response policies and actions to the extent possible, whether inside or outside the community. Now, when a crisis breaks, there is a need for a political lead to be nominated because the board as such cannot be. There needs to be one single person. And either there must be a permanent lead or there must be procedures in place to quickly nominate uh, one to be so. Uh, finally, I say crisis arrangements, they will only work, and this is experience we have learned time and again, if they are well oiled on a routine basis. The Supreme Crisis Board and the political lead, they will only be able to undertake the above outlined task if their respective institutional structures are able to work and cooperate in a smooth and concerted fashion. And this, in turn, can only be ensured if these very organizational structures are accustomed to work together on an everyday basis. And to this end, there is therefore a need to ensure that all Brussels-based crisis response mechanisms be effectively linked up in a structured manner on an everyday basis. So to sum up my conclusions on this, I think there is a case to be made for carefully considering the closest possible collaborations between crisis response centers covering the entire policy range of EU interest. And second, that the EU is currently in an early stages of institutional and organizational adaptations brought upon it as a consequence of the Lisbon Treaty. The creation of the European External Action Service should not be an occasion to create a third body within the EU with its own distinctive capabilities, but as an opportunity to overcome current divisions, duplications, overlapping and competitions, and to construct a single unifying structure. In a real and serious crisis situation, crisis response structures will only function optimally in a concerted manner if procedures and cooperation are tried and tested on an everyday basis. And this can be achieved either by creating a common entity covering all policy branches, that means a model whereby all sector-specific crisis response entities are co-located or effectively integrated, or by enhanced cooperation whereby robust liaison and cooperation arrangements ensure effective cooperation and coordination on an everyday basis. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much. And now we will continue. And the next speaker.
will come from Estonia and the, the former Minister of the Interior in our neighboring country, Mr. Kalle Lane. You are welcome. Thank you, Madam. It's a great pleasure to be here, and um, I will give to you my personal view about this question. Dear friends, current approach to combat terrorism. Our airport technology is outdated. We look for metal, but the new explosives are made of plastic. We solely look for dangerous items, but not on dangerous people. We only focus on security when people are heading to the gates. Every strategy we have is reactionary. Terrorists attack targets on airports in the future, but they will target busy times on the front end of the airport when where people are checking in or like in Moscow, waiting for arriving people. It, it would be easy for someone to take two suitcases of explosives, walk up to a busy check-in line or to another waiting queue, ask a person next to them to watch their backs for a minute while they run to the restroom or get a drink and then detonate the bags before security even gets involved. Terrorist attacks are seriously imminent and will involve suicide bombers and non-suicide bombers in places where large groups of people congregate. The attacks will be characterized by simultaneous detonations around the country or the European Union. Terrorists like big impact, involving at least five to eight cities including rural areas. The terrorists who want to destroy the heart of the country will not use sophisticated weapons. They like to use suicide as a frontline approach. It's cheap, it's easy, it's effective. And there is an infinite abundance of young militants more than willing to meet their destiny. The next level of terrorists in America and in Europe will not be coming from abroad. They will be instead home ground, having attended and been educated in our own schools and universities right here in Europe. We have to look for students who regularly travel back and forth to the Middle East. These young terrorists will be most dangerous because they will look like us, know our language and will fully understand the habits of ourselves. We as society are unaware and uneducated about the terrorist threats we will inevitably face. We need to instead follow countries like Israel, Ireland and England with examples of human intelligence, both from an infiltration perspective as well as to pay attention to and trust aware citizens to help. We need to engage and educate ourselves as citizens. There is an importance of having methods and plans that are agreed upon of how to combat and respond in the event, event of terrorist emergency. We have to develop plans with tools we care about. Better that you, you have plans in place and never have to use them than to have no plans in place and find you needed them. Police tactics in the free world have been formulated by very restrictive legal measures in order to protect civil rights and the right for privacy. These restrictions have led to police field culture based on response after crime has been launched or committed rather than on prevention through proactive intervention. In the present police field culture, limited prevention is achieved by generating deterrence based on police presence, static and mobile, as well as a prosecution and conviction. This approach is, has proven to be reliability effective in mitigation crime, since common criminals are motivated by profit and can be deterred by risk of arrest and conviction that are high enough to outbalance the gain. In the age of terrorism, this formula doesn't work. Terrorists are not deterred by police presence or by the possibility of conviction, since many of them are committed, committing themselves by use of suicidal tactics.
Responsive police tactics are almost irrelevant in the case of terrorism, as in most cases the criminals are dead. The role of field police officers in protecting the public against acts of terrorism is only matched by good anti-terrorism intelligence. Recent events have demonstrated that intelligence cannot be relied upon as the only line of defense and many terrorist attacks are still taking place without early warning. The main concern when the, we turn police officers into proactive preventive agents are the, that they will use briogism, like racial profiling in the process and or they will jeopardize civil rights by enforcing themselves on legitimate members of the public. We have to achieve prevention capacity at the field level by providing officers with a tactical tool based on analytic intelligence, concept of targeted information gathering, analysis and conclusion drawing. There is a fashionable trend to look at behavior observation as a tool that is able to provide us with enough information to identify terrorists. Our experience leads us to believe that only in very rare and extreme cases, like observing the presence of an explosive device in someone's possession, this is possible. In reality, the best we can hope for the indicators or signals that are much less than a smoking gun and therefore require further study. Traditional police approach to a suspect is based on a recognized probably cause or reasonable suspicion. This results with a typical aggressive attitude that is establishes these rules of engagement of an encounter with the officers in threatening control position. In the case of terrorism, we do not have a luxury of establishing the preconditions and therefore we must work with the assumption, assumption that most people that triggered our attention on behavior basis are not terrorists. We also assume that if there is a terrorist at the, that place and time, there is a high probability that he will be in the group we are looking at. Since it is easier to prove innocence than to prove guilt, our efforts are dedicated to establishing innocence of the subjects of our interest to differ from traditional way of searching for evidence to support guilt. Here I would like to introduce a methodology called behavior pattern recognition developed by the Security Training International in Wiesbaden, Germany, led by Ulrich Tünnes. BPI is methodology developed for use by law enforcement, police officers and frontline employees in order to improve their capabilities of prevent acts of violence terrorists and criminals by early detection of behavioural indicators followed by a structured information build-up process that leads to intervention where required. The BPR user implements tactics to recruit the subject's trust and cooperation. It is through this cooperation that the innocence of the subject is quickly and respectfully established. On the other hand, the bad guys who need to conceal the truth entangled in the net of lies they have set themselves. The BPR targeted conversation is a modified version of the Israeli aviation security interview designed to detect deceit and not necessarily the truth behind it. The behavior pattern recognition methodology at first, study your environment. You need to know the regular in order to be able to detect the irregular. Secondly, be familiar with terrorist and criminal modus operandi in the area and the behavior patterns typical to these modus operandi. Third, choose your positions and patrol route there according to your early analysis. Fourth, observe and search for the behavior patterns in all categories, body language, tactical, weapon related. Fifth, after initial patterns detection continue your surveillance surveillance without exposing your interest to the subject. Focus on other patterns in subject behavior, including communication with the others in the area. Sixth, use elicitation techniques to intensify the relevant patterns. Seventh, approach the subject in a calculated manner while using stress reduction techniques. Eighth, identify yourself in a friendly manner and recruit the subject cooperation. Ninth, 
Implement the targeted conversation technique to complete your information and detect any deceit attempts. Tense. Analyze the information obtained and draw the conclusions that may lead either to loss of interest in, in the subjects or a shift to fully law enforcement treatment, detention and interrogation. Behavior pattern recognition in a wide context. BPA is designed to fit into the wider context deploying non-police security agents, screeners, guards, private security, etc., etc., as well as non-security frontline employees by training each of the groups to their level starting by BPA awareness level, only going to detect and report only and all the way to the unique conditions of airline crew at high altitude. This wide approach is aimed at creation of a multi-layer suspicious behaviour detection based on the understanding that when we look for irregularities, there is no one who can do it better than the frontline employees who are very familiar with their work environment and are present in every part of the facility, while police presence is usually very limited. Mr. Dunnes, a well-repeated and very much experienced former police officer, is dealing with aviation security since decades, and Mr. Max Peter Ratzel, the former director of Europol, has stressed that the behaviour pattern recognition is the best available method for detecting potential terrorists. We are too much oriented to check materials, not persons. I would like to stress importance to be flexible. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Mr. Lanet. And now we will continue and go on the other side of the Baltic Sea. The former State Secretary of Finland, Mr. Dr. Risto Vola. Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much for, uh, for giving me this uh, uh, unique opportunity to address this important seminar. The background of this invitation obviously is that uh, I was involved as a state secretary in Finland in first in running or managing the tsunami operation in Finland and then preparing our crisis management system. In fact, those things I will touch now are uh, already discussed here. Uh, when Mr. Engel Hansen discussed about the European level, uh, I have picked up as a perspective uh, the historical and perhaps a constitutional uh, dimension of the experience we now have in most of the member countries, I think in all of them. And also I make some references to the academic discussion we have at the observation which are now quite, quite, uh, uh, quite, quite common in European and the, in the American uh, debates. For most of us, or maybe all of us, uh, disasters and crises were something uh, for, for decades, maybe centuries, something very far away geographically and historically. We have the, in Europe the uh, 1755 disaster in Lisbon, and then we have in our memories many other disasters from uh, 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 last centuries and, and decades. But then, obviously, uh, the 9-11 uh, opened our eyes in many ways uh, or, or touched us in such a way that nowadays we feel that a disaster, a crisis, is something more or less everyday business. It comes every week, some disaster somewhere, and some people around the world are trying to manage these disasters. And what is important is that this is not just a, a technical operation, just like Mr. Engel Hansen said. This is now coming uh, something which touches uh, the fundamentals of our political uh, and, and state organizations. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the theme or the topic of crisis and democracy, how to run crisis in a democratic state or democratic European Union, is it's a fundamental question uh, in, in many ways. Uh, we have this experience from Lisbon 1755, and perhaps the first Euro well known European crisis manager was the Prime Minister Marques Pompal, who has a great statute in, in the middle of Lisbon. People came to him and said, What can we now do? There are tens of thousands of people here who are dead, and all the houses are ruined. And he gave the instruction for crisis management bury the dead and heal the living. And that was the instruction for crisis management of the time. Then we have this uh, recent uh, crisis. But what is important already here uh, mentioned, some, uh, there are several reasons and backgrounds why really the disasters and the crisis 
are increasing in numbers in, in, in many ways. Now we don't speak only about the earthquakes, we speak about is it uh, terrorism, is it natural, is it climate change or whatever. And this is something, let us see for instance the situation in, in Australia. The Australian government is working with the floods and storms on the eastern frontier, with the forest fires on the western frontier, and the, the, the sand uh, storms in, in south. This is something that security government, uh, governance is becoming a fundamental element of modern state. Therefore, its organization will determine much of the nature of the modern democracy. And this, I congratulate this ALDE group that we now go to the fundamental issue, how we will organize the modern government, modern democratic state to face this unfortunate fact that there are more and more crises and disasters. The classical issues are still there, of course, classical security issues, geopolitics and so forth and so on. But now we see that there is something uh, uh, which we can say that these, it's only not geopolitical. The, the dynamic, complex, networked environment is something which touches us all. World is networked. If there is a 9-11 in New York, it has a network background somewhere in the po uh, on, the, on the globe, and it also has network uh, effect around the world. If there is a tsunami, you have your tourist networks, uh, it makes it relevant for everybody. And if there is a, 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 a uh, eruption of, of ashes from, from Iceland, you see that the European uh, 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 airplanes are stopped on the fields. So this networking of the world, on the one hand, it helps the security, but on the other hand, if there is an explosion, the, 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 the effect is felt around the world and, and also in Europe. This makes the crisis management even more difficult as, as it's just on the basis of the figures. In historical context, when there was a segmented society, there was explosion in one part of the society and you had the police force or fire people going to rescue officers to going to, to settle it down. In the first place it means that there should be this kind of capacity to deliver a crisis management operation which covers the whole whole network environment or the whole, whole, uh, whole issue, but how to mobilize a government after this history of fragmented government to do that, that's a real problem, which we heard is a problem in, in, in European Union, Commission, Council, uh, Member States, but it's also made a fundamental problem on the level of, of uh, uh, Member States themselves. In theory, you can, it's not so difficult to define what are the fundamentals of crisis management. First, you have, must have the situational awareness system, know where you are. There should be a quick overreaction, rather, because you can always come back. There is a stronger communication, a vertical coordination. You must act on geometry, as it says, so just the brain on the face of plain fact. But then we have also the iron laws of bureaucracy and also what is important practice, the rule of law, government, democratic government. It's also, in theory, not so difficult to define what is the, the, the generic model of crisis government. You must have the high, highest undivided authority Mr. Engel Hansen said it very, very beautifully. Um, if it's not, if it's big enough, then it will be poly political. So it means that the crisis should be managed as low as possible, and the larger the crisis, the higher the level. And when it's uh, high enough, the level, uh, it, when it's large enough, then it will be political. But it's just not just just on-off situation. It is related to to, to the whole whole chain. Then there are several levels, the sub-highest level, the, the interface between political and administrative level, and the uh, permanent uh, operation. But what is important, these all are interrelated to each other. And now we come to the situation in most of the uh, democratic governments in Europe, and you see that the, it's, it's the, uh, the, the situation, how can I, I, I put it here? You see that uh, one of the situations is that we have the rule of law, tradition and legal competence for all of the authorities. The rule of law is just to protect the citizens against abuse of power, but now many of our governments, uh, government units say, this is our crisis, don't touch it. Uh, I have it experience in Finland in Tsunami, but also President Bush uh, describes the Katrina storm, he called to a governor and governor said, uh, Mr. President, this is my crisis, don't touch it. Uh, because legally it was his crisis. 
but only when there was a problem and press was attacking, then it was found the Supreme Commander will be the guilty. Then there is the, the, the also this kind of uh, autopoietics, or let us say the self-regulation of the government, and, and, and uh, then there's a major uh, historical question, how can we develop a undivided authority, and what is the sovereign decision making, uh, make, maker in, 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 uh, in, in democratic government? These sound simple questions, but when you discuss with uh, in, in, in concrete terms of, of your constitution, of your laws, you come in, in, in some of the fundamentals of modern democratic government. We know this uh, uh, this sea law model activity every now and there, and also I can while imagine how problematic all these things are in European Union, and I, I hope the seminar will help us to address uh, the issue not only on, on government level, uh, uh, member state level, but also in European Union, the idea of getting single crisis platform of political leadership. It's difficult on state level, but it's, uh, it's understandable how complicated it is on European Union level. And what is important here is that when they are the, uh, the, the, the professionals of security and political level, let's avoid the idea that the professional says this is, this is something professional, let us do it on ourselves, or the politicians, you, uh, professionals, you should do it. This is a business, historically, which is a business of both political level and, and the, uh, the, the, the professional level. And here we have many historical memories on the military aspect. Now we have, uh, in a way, the same situation all the way around, from, from Cicero to, to, to Mr. I, uh, Brent Eisenhower. Uh, there is every now and then the issue, how do you relate the political level and the management level or professional level? And at the end of the day, it's the political level which is the supreme uh, responsible, and only on political level you can make the binding decisions. But how do you do that? There will be many problems. Uh, still, there are many problems with that. There was a discussion about this in the in, in, in United States also after the war, and, and as, as it's the, the well-known uh, ideas of Clemenceau and, and Clausewitz, they discuss about this question of supreme commander in, in, in military terms, but in fact the same dynamics of legal systems and, and government is now not only in military crisis, but on, in all the crisis management sectors. So, uh, but if you take in this way, the democracy and effectiveness, they support each other. Because democratic decision making is the highest one, and in, in crisis management you need the highest undivided authority to support the processes on all the levels. So this is something which is very tough on national level and also on European level, but this is something we got to develop. How, what is the interface and what relation between the uh, crisis management professionals and the political level? But without political level, you don't get the binding, undivided, highest decisions and support for, 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 for large-scale operations. And now we come to the legal problems. Uh, there are some traditions here. And, and what is now interesting to see that, in fact, we are discussing uh, about the legal problems, crisis management, exactly the same discussion we had in the 20s, 30s in, in Europe. So there are the, the main, three main traditions to address how to organize the crisis management in democratic government. One is the so-called so positivistic tradition of uh, Ms., uh, Hans Kelsen. And his key point is that there are no exceptions in law. The validity of norm remains unaffected if, a concrete, if, if in the concrete instance a fact does not correspond to the norm. So the idea that a legal structure is there, and is it crisis or not, it shouldn't be touched. And if there is not a legal norm for a crisis, then it's a problem of crisis not, and not of the legal norm. And you had this debate in Germany uh, when Mr. Carl Schmidt said that there is uh, that unfortunately for a crisis, cri by definition, crisis has no legal form, legal norms. So norms are for normal situation, and if it's a crisis, it's not normal situation, then do you, you can't have law. And then you block each other, and unfortunately, the, the, the debate in, in, in Europe in the 20s, 30s went to a deadlock, and all the unfortunate political developments we so well know. 
But then there is a liberal, uh, tradi or li li let us say, democratic liberal Lockean tradition, which humbly says that many things there are, which, uh, 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 which the law can by no means provide for, and those must be necessarily left to the discretion of him that has the executive power in his hands. So in modern democratic parliamentary system, this might be the way to proceed, uh, to, to, to find the authority and the structure which can uh, be the, 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 uh, the supreme structure of, 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 of structuring uh, crisis management or crisis, uh, crisis uh, government. And here are just a few examples uh, of the deep paper we now have. There are serious arguments already now in the positivist way say that whatever the world is, uh, uh, you, you, by, by definition, the rule of law demands and the legal uh, structure demands that you can't have a special arrangement for crisis management. But if we go there, and when the crisis comes, there will be somebody to decide, and then the decision maker is trouble or takes the power in his own hands without law. Therefore, uh, it's, it's fundamental that we, we have this debate in Europe. So, conclusion, there are more and more crises in the world, unfortunately, and also security issues. Therefore, there's a need for effective crisis government and also networked security structure. Uh, today we study one concrete issue uh, on, on crisis management, but it's also handled in the, in the protocols. Who has the authority and how we legally make the structure in such a way that in critical situation there will be a decision maker and support uh, for, for the, 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 the operators. And in constitutional, democratic, legal, state system, it's a very difficult problem. Uh, and, and in a way, there are many arguments saying that, uh, for instance, uh, this Mr. Gross of the, the, the legal theorist of, or, or, or says that, uh, well, uh, it's up to the decision maker uh, then to make, uh, to, to break the law in, in the best interest of the, 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 the citizens. For instance, for tsunami in Finland, when it came, we didn't have law, we didn't have money, but we made the decision. And if we didn't succeed, Prime Minister and I would, would have gone to the court. And, and, and this is also, of course, the situation. You must make decisions, and now we must develop such a structure and, uh, that, that you can make decisions, legally based decisions, and respect also the rule of law. Therefore, uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, rule of law, democratic and effective security governance, and highly skilled security professionals. Yet they and you and we are the core of the uh, preconditions for modern democratic state. We are now discussing how to develop the European Union structure and government structure in its fundamentals, and therefore this mission, this is also mission for ALDE, this is mission for all Democrats in Europe. It's a tough issue, but unfortunately very necessary and important issue. Thank you very much. A key aspect of the project, Research Technology Development Force, was to stimulate, promote and develop new methods and tools on prevention and fight against CBRN related terrorism as well as promote the development of prevention and preparedness and emergency management in the case of CBRN3 in flight passenger, passenger traffic to and for the European Union. Uh, we uh, made in this research, we made uh, a scenarios. These scenarios uh, and this goal was achieved during the week of uh, 11, 14 uh, October, when more than 80 participants of, from Belgium, China, Denmark, Germany, Hong Kong, Italy, Macedonia, uh, the Netherlands, uh, with, uh, Sweden, the United Na States uh, and Finland took part uh, during the four days long life and uh, ta tablet uh, exercise. Participants represent embassies, the EU Situation Center, authorities from several countries and the project of advisory partners. Important, very important. 
the preparedness uh, was the preparedness and response. This preparedness and response so was the core uh, of the ETER project seek, uh, seeking to common operational administrative and strategic measures to improve security in cross-border passenger traffic and supports, supports the development and security standards and procedures. These, is, uh, are, uh, these are uh, towards uh, to, uh, to give uh, the, uh, the uh, idea in, uh, in, in, uh, general, uh, in general aspects, uh, for the, in the general aspect. But of course, uh, of these uh, problems, uh, we have uh, two speakers uh, that uh, explain uh, and explain and uh, uh, analyze uh, concretely the, uh, the a project, the ether project, and in general the concept. Uh, the concept. We start uh, with uh, the intervention of uh, uh, Magnus uh, Norm uh, Normark Research Fellow, Research Fellow uh, in Katz, uh, that is in the Fiedish, uh, Swedish National Defense College. Uh, the other uh, roles uh, played by uh, Magnus Normark, uh, you see in the a brief in the short in the short uh, curriculum please uh, manius normak thank you chair good afternoon ladies and gentlemen um, i will for the next 15 minutes or so uh, give you a brief overview of one of three studies that uh, the center for asthmatic threat studies has uh, conducted within the framework of uh, project ether and that is uh, understanding CBR and terrorism and overall assessment. The objective for the study is to elaborate on CBR and terrorism threat in general and um, against the civil passenger aviation sector in particular. This study is a literature review uh, based on open source information. Um, we also conducted a um, some interviews uh, within the framework of, of, of the work. In this report I describe and elaborate on contemporary threat perceptions um, of CBR and terrorism expressed by various committees, organizations and governments. Furthermore, I've briefly described past incidents of terrorist attempts to develop and use CBR materials, um, large scale as well as small scale efforts. I've also described some of the probable factors driving these kind of actors to pursue a CBR and attack for political purposes, but also as important, um, the thresholds these actors are facing when they're making such an approach. I conclude my paper with an assessment of the potential convergence between CBR and attacks as a method of choice and civil passenger aviation sector as a target for terrorism. In my review of threat perceptions, um, I've specifically been looking at the most recent expressions, including from the UN Security Council, um, the European Union, from countries such as the United States, but also from various committees. One example is the US Commission on Prevention of WMD Proliferation and Terrorism, uh, which published its findings regarding the threat in a report in December 2008, uh, World at Risk. They concluded that there will be a WMD attack somewhere in the world within five years unless we act with urgency in order to prevent this type, type of events. And that our margin of safety is shrinking, not growing. This assessment were form, foremost focused on nuclear and biological aspects of the problem and was heavily weighted on the consequence side of risk rather than intent and capabilities by arguing that the rapid globalization trend is increasing the likelihood of terrorist acquiring capabilities to perform these kind of attacks. Globalization is indeed a vital part of assessing the evolving risk, but currently it's a potential vulnerability in modern society uh, that may become exploited by terrorists in the future. Also within the European Union, the fear of terrorism using CBR materials in future attacks are substantial. A WMD strategy was adopted in 2003 and has been updated and developed since then. A CBRN task force was established by the Commission in February 2008, uh, which consisted of more than 200 expert representatives from the member states, authorities and organizations. 
The findings of this task force have been converted into a European Union CBR and action plan with priorities list of measures that are being implemented throughout the member states as well as at the European Union level. One observation made from this review of is that perceptions of CBR and terrorism threats are foremost based on three key aspects. Indications of terrorist interest and efforts of acquiring CBR and capabilities. Um, this is to a large degree shaped by rhetoric from these type of groups and distribution of manuals and correspondence uh, regarding the use of CBR materials in attacks, more or less um, useful in character but also decreasing thresholds for acquisition of materials, equipment and knowledge uh, through the globalization effect. Um, the potential consequences of a successful CBR attack heavily linked to vulnerabilities in modern societies is an aspect commonly found in different assessments of the threat. Now this is, however, not a factor that should be included in assessing the threat and the likelihood of events like these, as it is a factor for assessing the risk the consequences. We should, however, keep in mind that there are, may be classified information of events and observations shaping these threat perceptions, undisclosed for the public domain, and therefore not included in this report. Moving from perceptions of the potential threat to past incidents, um, a glance of past ev events makes it clear that we are talking about a potential threat. There has not been a mass casualty CBR on terrorism yet. Um, and there, but however, there are a few examples of events which had a clear potential of creating mass destruction, mass casualties, um, such as the Serene attacks in Japan by Aum Shinrikyo in 1994 and again in 1995, the Rai sect using pathogens in Dallas, Oregon in the mid 80s, and the Ameritrex events in the US um, preceding the 9 11 attacks. But as I elaborate in this study, these efforts more than anything else enlightens the many thresholds and bottlenecks these actors have to overcome in order to achieve a successful mass casualty attack with these kind of substances and materials. I've also analyzed the occurrence of threats, hoaxes, and small-scale attacks with CBR materials registered as terrorist-related incidents. Two of the world's largest databases of such events are the Global Terrorist Database, administrated by the DHS Center of Excellence at the University of Maryland in the US, and the World Incident Tracking System, administrated by the US National Counterterrorism Center in Washington. <coughs> at a first glance, this may look as a significant amount of CBR and terrorism events. However, a major part of these incidents caused no harm at all. Um, I will not go into details behind these, um, these statistics, but amongst the chemical events in uh, GTD2, um, only 29 of the 235 incidents caused more than 10 injuries or, or casualties. Um, and, and most of them were a combination of chemicals and explosives where the chemical substance only had a minor effect or no effect at all. Attacks against private individuals and anti-abortion related incidents represents a very large part of these attacks. Most troublesome, troublesome trend in these statistics is, however, that a majority of the poisoning and chemical attacks registered by the WITS, um, causing more than 500 wounded, has been performed by Taliban in Afghanistan during the last two and a half years. These include attacks against school for girls, and attacks against police and local government representatives through food poisoning. To conclude this review of past incidents, it's obvious that there are interest and specific attractions for terrorists to include these substances and materials in their modes of operation. One profound aspect is the impact of reference to weapons of mass destruction or chemical or biological weapons, which triggers a fear unlike other conventional means. It is as much a psychological weapon as anything else. And this makes the media attention so much more intense when these toxic and poisonous materials are mentioned in connection to terrorists and their activities. 
Leadership influence, often combined with the leadership's fascination of these kind of weapons, have been an important driving force for some of the groups who have aspired on developing and using these kind of weapons. There are also signs of an interaction between Western politi political leadership's stated fears for the tremendous impact these weapons might have if used in densely populated areas, and the initial interest in pursuing these kind of capabilities uh, within these terrorist groups. It is also important to pay attention to the numerous constraints that pursuing a CBR and capability entails. Some of them are highlighted in this study. Uh, the, of course, the technical and competence thresholds are of a very mixed nature for each uh, of the different technological strands which are also presented in, in, in this paper. Looking at the past incidents, it is clear that there are key thresholds such as acquiring the right substances and materials to successfully develop the amount and proper quality of the agent, as well as, and perhaps this is the most challenging one, um, the difficulties in effectively disseminate the agent in order to cause the intended impact at the target. The concluding part of the paper is focused on the potential convergence of terrorists pursuing their capability to use CBR materials as a means to target international civil aviation. We do, know that terrorist great, we do know that terrorists great interest in these transport sector, driven by its international character and notion as an international center stage, which gets the headlines all over the world if targeted. This slide shows some incidents that have shaped many of the um, security measures implemented at airports and aircrafts today. Um, it lists only a part of all the security measures that have been taken at airports during the last decade. But it is very clear that the level of security has risen significantly, especially during the last 10 years, and that the dimensioning factor for this security is the fear of passengers carrying explosives, firearms, and sharp objects. We've also seen that this escalation of security faced countermeasures by the terrorists. And I'm sure we will witness further um, continued efforts uh, by these actors in the future as well. We have, however, fortunately or not, not seen any indication of terrorists trying to use CBR and materials against airports or aircraft, aircrafts up until today. And we can only hope that we won't. There is some ambiguous information of attacks against airports with poisonous gases and pathogens, as well as few assassinations of passengers in airplanes. But as a colleague of mine at the University of Maryland, Gary Ackerman, uh, stated in an article some years ago, uh, we tend to put undue reliance of past observables, meaning that there are so many factors shaping future events that we have no observable data on. Making assessments on future events solely based on past observables very unreliable. In the concluding part of this study, I have elaborated on what may attract these actors to deviate from their current methods in their activities. In a previous slide, I referred to the game changer effect as one of the, one of the potential incent incentives for terrorists to pursue one of the CBRM paths for terrorist attacks, simply to try to escalate the effect in terms of media coverage, increased fear, but also in creating a very difficult situation for the first responders with all the precautionary measures a potential CBRM event uh, requires, and, and of course, with the additional socio-economical and economical costs. One additional aspect which, has, which I specifically highlight in this study is the potential incentive that an increased security level may create and the innovative approach this might lead to amongst the terrorists. The very complex infrastructure of a modern international air airport uh, presents opportunities that might become explored by these actors in the future. One possible aspect could be the cleaning service of the catering service on board, uh, toxins, toxic chemicals, radioactive substances injected in the food served during the flight could easily create enough difficulties on board to achieve a devastating impact. Now, this method is relatively simple in comparison to try to smuggle explosives on board and to successfully ignite the explosives during flight, which is becoming increasingly difficult as we have seen. In the aftermath of the pandemic H1N1 virus, we all know the rapid spread of contagious diseases through hubs like airports and the fear and cost for the society that this entails. 
This should not have been passed unnoticed by actors with agenda, in, which includes creating mass casualty incidents in order to convey the, their message to a wider audience. Finally, small-scale attacks may become a reality by pure opportunity, by gaining access to facilities, storing or handling toxic or contagious agents, or the recruiting of technically skilled operatives that can shape future events. And with that, I conclude the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Magnus Normark uh, for his uh, analysis that uh, is an uh, introduction, a very important, uh, and his introduction to the research explained, presented by uh, Timo Ellenberg. Mr. Timo, please. Professor Gasparini, thank you very much for the, uh, for the kind presentation and introduction. And also, thank you, Magnus, for very, very professional presentation, which basically described the essentials of the research of the two-year work we have conducted among the uh, 18 project partners in the project ETHER. Uh, I feel very humble to introduce our project today. Uh, I think that uh, a project like this should uh, always be based on solid cross-cutting partnership. And uh, as was uh, mentioned earlier by uh, Dick Heymans from DG Home Affairs, the major donor and, and uh, financier of this project, uh, uh, this project has included five countries directly when it comes to the partnership. And additionally, we have been working with uh, Russian, Chinese, and, uh, and also other third countries like the uh, like US and the United States uh, Homeland Security Department. Uh, this kind of partnership is, of course, about the partners. And one of the major challenges, what, what I feel we have confronted, is how to find a good, good partners who can deliver in due time, who are reliable and also active, and I would say sometimes also a little bit stubborn to deal with. Uh, we have been very lucky because uh, this is uh, already a project, uh, uh, I would say, fifth of the kind we have delivered for DG Home Affairs. And uh, I think we have quite nice partnership conducted and, and we are able to, to work in quite demanding conditions like in the project ETHER, which is about aviation safety in case of uh, CBRN terrorism. The project started in uh, April 2009 and uh, it is a kind of combination of exercises assessments, workshops, and of course, the final publication, the guidelines, which we are bound to deliver in a couple of weeks. Uh, the project is coordinated by Finnish partners, University of Helsinki, and of course, as you have seen from the program, quite many speakers are from Finland for, for just the reason that the exercise was, was uh, implemented in, at the Helsinki airport last October. We are very, very grateful for the uh, DG Home Affairs for supporting this project. I think it's not enough that we have an idea and we have a nice partnership, but we also need uh, financing, and particularly donors with the courage, political courage and imagination to support a new type of project initiatives like the ETHER has been. Uh, I wouldn't say that when we started the project, we, we had a clear-cut idea where we, are we are, where we are going, because at that time, the CBR and Action Plan was quite a new type of uh, uh, policy initiative. And the idea of the project was also to test how to implement, how to, how to take into account all the nuances and, and the characteristics of the CBR and Action Plan at the national level of the member states. Here are the two key questions we asked during the two-year project. How the emergency response and crisis coordination arrangements 
are organized and how do they correlate with the overall C CBRN terrorism related uh, mechanisms and on the other how the CCA would work in effective case of aviation terrorism. Let's imagine an airplane, let's say Airbus 340 as it is uh, European, uh, 340 flying from Hong Kong to Helsinki in a Russian airspace carrying 300 passengers. Just a normal flight. Uh, during the flight, somewhere above Novosibirsk, uh, some of the passengers are facing symptoms. The breathing gets difficult, they feel dizzy, and some of them might turn to be aggressive against the cabin crew. How this, how this kind of situation would develop further on? What type of uh, nuances should be involved if this type of incident would escalate to cover the whole cabin and, and of course, to have a dimensions of any type of uh, criminal activity or even terrorism. It, it's, it's a simple scenario, but it's absolutely challenging when it comes to the situational awareness of the decision makers. Most importantly, the air operator in this case, we are very grateful for Finnair company for being part of the project, for providing the facilities and, of course, taking care of the most of the live exercise leadership. But in this kind of situation, it's not only about the technology, it's not only about the uh, engineering and the nice nuances of how to deliver the situation picture from the one agency to the other. The question is how to deal also with the intergovernmental level, how to deal with the uh, several governments either pro proposing to help, either proposing to send aid, or either demanding response, uh, demanding answer. So uh, eventually, this type of simple scenario might turn out to be a quite a, a multidimensional situation where you do need to have different layers and different assessments uh, from different disciplines. So what we have done is, is to have a kind of multidisciplinary approach to this scenario, and of course, to bear in mind the DG Home Affairs policy to have a kind of comprehensive, uh, comprehensive assessment of this type of uh, uh, situation where you have uh, both preparedness, uh, preparedness uh, response, and, and consequence management uh, uh, stages taken into account, both in the assessment but also in, in the actual uh, exercise. Uh, this picture is my favorite one. It, it basically underlines the, the importance of decisive action. I think uh, uh, Risto Volanen uh, pointed out tsunami quite well and the lessons learned from tsunami within the Nordic governments, but I, I think this is one of the things we learned from this project. Uh, there's a certain need in, in the complex CBN, CBRN related crisis, there's a certain need for cross-sectoral preparedness, that's for sure. We should share information and, and to, to take into account that there are different operational cultures in different countries and different agencies. The second thing I think what should be bearing in mind is the decisive and overwhelming response to use all the tools, all the latest <laughs> equipments we have in the response without sparing them to the next crisis situation. And the third one, I think, is, is the sufficient and professional consequence management to use professionalism, not necessarily political mechanisms. But that's, that's of course, a broader matter. But the first 48 hours was critical in our exercise planning and, and exercise experience, and I think that's, that's a lesson to learn. The situational awareness <coughs> is one of the things uh, which was a kind of uh, red line through the project, through the uh, assessments, tabletop exercise, and the following live exercise. How to enhance and how to assure that there is a situational awareness, a two-way road, and the shared situational awareness within the, all the stakeholders, from the cabin crew all the way to the uh, air operators, crisis coordination center, and along the way, all the way to the uh, Prime Minister's Office, Government Council uh, Crisis Centre. And that was, that was uh, one of the things we studied. So I, we could 
also uh, emphasize the fact that uh, besides of uh, trying to have a comprehensive uh, assessment of this type of uh, threat and, uh, and all its uh, dimensions, we also uh, had a particular view on the situational awareness and, of course, the comprehensive EU response. Okay. Uh, we also divided our approach to two, two basic levels. On the other hand, we, we looked at the uh, political strategic level, which basically means the intergovernmental response and intergovernmental response, including the uh, European Union Situation Center, of course, and, uh, and, uh, and the CCA as a whole. On the other hand, we, we uh, had a careful look on the uh, operational tactical level, which means mainly the national level response, but also at some states it means uh, how the European Union mechanisms would have been taken into account and how they would uh, contribute to the uh, member state level. Uh, needless to say, we were lucky in this project. Uh, as I said, we had 18 partners from five countries. Uh, we had uh, research agencies, we had private companies, and uh, most importantly, which I'm happy about, we had a clear governmental support uh, from governmental agencies uh, from, from Finland, Sweden, and, and Finland, uh, Italy. And of course, as I said, we also enjoyed uh, uh, both uh, substantial support and, of course, uh, political support from Hong Kong government and also uh, U.S. Homeland Security Department. So I, it, was a, it was a good project as a whole when it comes to the uh, partnership uh, as, as such. About the concept, I think. I think this is important to point out. Uh, to run the project like this, which is built on combination of assessments, workshops and on the other exercises, one of the key tasks is to distribute the responsibilities among the partners. So, so what we had was a kind of uh, project map where we, on the other hand, we divided the project to different working packages. We had a, one working package on research led by Lars Nikander from Swedish National Defense College. He's the director of CATS. We had uh, one working package for the live exercise, which was led by Karl Karvonen from uh, Finnar, he's the head of security. We had one working package for the tabletop exercise, which was led by, of course, governmental support and governmental representative Timo Harkonen, who is the director of government security from Finland. And then we also had separate working packages for scenario itself, because in order to have and valuable and worthwhile exercises. You need to have a dynamism inside of the scenario. And, and that, that was the reason why we used a separate working group to de develop the scenario, which was led by uh, Colonel Pekka Visuri, who is somewhere here. OK. Uh, the exercise itself, it took three days. We started as uh, simulating the threat itself, the preparedness. And uh, after the preparedness stage, we went to the response. And that was the tabletop exercise held within the government premises, House of Estates. And uh, besides of having several governmental agencies taking part, we were very, very happy to have a European Union citizen situation center. Uh, at place and taking active involvement to the exercise. So thank you for that as well. Uh, the third day was uh, consequence management, the live exercise at the airport, and that was basically uh, testing and developing a new type of decontamination process, how we can evacuate 300 people relatively rapidly from the aeroplane, which is contaminated with some sort of uh, uh, material 
I'm not, I don't have an opportunity to go to the details. But let's say there are several materials which can be used in terrorist purposes, and one of them can be quite lethal during the nine-hour flight uh, like this. So, so we tested how we can clean up the plane and, and how the patients can be, can be uh, taken to the medical care. And, uh, of course, we were also lucky to have uh, specialists from Finnish Defence Forces, several private companies, and that way to really to put the, uh, the whole exercise team and the whole partnership to their utmost limits in order to test where to go. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm bound to conclude very, very, very shortly, but just a few points just to underline what we have learned in this project. Uh, there's unlimited number of threat scenarios. The, the, the risks and threats are always different. And, and uh, uh, two things I've learned. One is that they're always different, and the other one is that they, they often have a political dimension. So it's not only engineering, it's not only medics, it's not only uh, uh, some special niche, but it's, it's, it has to be cross-cutting approach in order to deal with these, these uh, things. Uh, one of the things we confronted quite often was that uh, there is still some sort of unwillingness within the national authorities to take the full benefit from external expertise, and that can hinder the most fanciest and well-prepared project. You need to have a full support from governmental agencies in order to have a successful result. And most importantly, to take full benefit from European Union funding in a project like this. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kalelanik from, from Estonia, he, he pointed out the importance of human intelligence. Fully agree. I think uh, one of the things we, we learned also was that we have to find a kind of balance, uh, how to gather information and how to take benefit, both from human and technical appliances. And uh, I don't have a clear clear-cut answer for that. I guess the next speakers might have a more sophisticated approach on that. Okay. Then the question which was also raised by Risto Volanen was that uh, what is the ultimate model of national crisis management system in this type of complex situation? Should it be more centralized? Should it be specialized model? And I think uh, there's no one answer for that. All the countries are different, the operational cultures are different, and uh, we should respect that issue, also the historical backgrounds, geopolitical issues, so forth. So, But one thing what, what, of course, we learned is that the difficulty remains when we try to preserve sovereignty at the cost of interoperability, and that is, that is the task to deal with. Coordination, communication, information, team building, the easiest words in the world. But wait and see when you have an exercise where you have different kind of stakeholders involved. And uh, most importantly, you have different countries involved. And there might be some challenges um, to, to confront. Uh, I think, uh, as I said earlier, the live exercises should not be prepared to introduce the most developed uh, crisis management mechanisms, but to put them to their utmost limit and to see where they break down. This is the task, I think. And that's the only way we can serve our donors, to see where are the loopholes, well, or gaps, and how we can develop them further on. Mr. Chairman, I think this is absolutely everything I had, and, uh, and if there's any time, uh, maybe we can answer the question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ellenberg. He is uh, the, the leader, project leader of uh, ETHER project. Uh, now we have uh, some minutes for question and answer. Some minutes, few minutes. Some question? A couple of questions. Echo one, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Hellenberg. Uh, I uh, I wonder we are living in an open society, very liberal. Liberal. We 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 
care very much about uh, what we say, that we may say what we want, and uh, that we uh, cross borders where we, where we will. But um, we have very capable surveillance services, secret services, and uh, I'm amazed that since 9-11 there was not any such major event. There were hundreds prevented. Rarely do we read in the newspapers or on television what these capable people do. We are not aware of them. But my prime concern is, uh, you say, the major thing we can do is fill the gaps. But what, what can we do to forego a major terrorist attack in such a society, a liberal society, to prevent? How can we discourage these people that are religiously, we call it religion, in my opinion, it's nothing with religion, um, motivated? And if so, like the gentleman said, we have to expect a major attack let's say in 2013. There are countries which will have the bomb in less than two years. Uh, no democratic societies. How can we retaliate? Because we will not be able to retaliate in the same way they do, just to kill as many individuals as they can. We have to pinpoint those capable, those responsible. But in such a way, how can we, how can we do this? Thank you, sir. Answer. Thank you very much for for extremely good question. Uh, a few years ago, we organised a workshop on uh, with a topic on roots and roads of extremism and democracy. Uh, we which was organised jointly by US Academy of Science. We invited forty people from Iran, Syria, Jordan, the countries of Middle East to discuss about. Uh, how to uh, provide alternative options and alternative uh, toolbox for the radicalization and let's say the, the pathway towards the radicalization. And I, I think uh, if you consider the situation 10 years ago, just before 9-11, we could not have had an opportunity to have a seminar conference like this. There was no way we could have discussed about counterterrorism at the same time with a natural disaster reduction. There was no way to do that. 9-11, uh, 3,000 acres of land, uh, 3,000 people were killed, 24 hectares of land was destroyed. A lot of criticism afterwards against the, against the preparedness about the global response, but not many assessments about the fact that uh, half a year before 9-11, actually the Homeland Security Policy had been established and there had been some preparedness methods taken place within the US government. So I think uh, there are always two sides of the coin. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not going too long to this, but it's a fantastic question because in this project we, we were actually placed in a situation where the uh, if I may put it this way, customer, the DG Home Affairs, had given us a task to deal with the CBRN terrorism in one part of the one part of the critical infrastructure protection, which is the backbone of, of the whole policy today. And they, so we chose the uh, aviation, aviation for several reasons. Uh, our previous project was about shipping and maritime safety where we simulated the hijacking of passenger ferry at the Baltic Sea by two dozen of the extremists. Your question is, is difficult. I, I don't have any clear answer. Well, the only thing I can I think from our part is that uh, we should get these people involved in this business. We should get these people to, to provide their inputs. I mean, if we speak about radicalization, if we speak about extremism, there's no way that you can pull the issue with a rope. It's, it, you, you have to have a dialogue. And uh, in that respect, uh, when you speak about uh, critical infrastructure protection or project like this, CBR and terrorism, it's the common thing. It's the common thing. Look at the uh, case in the Moscow. It was a strike against the whole Western Hemisphere, let's say the whole global hemisphere. The, and, uh, and there's no way you say that uh, you can pinpoint that this was against certain type of nationality or certain type of social group within the nation. So, 
So I think involvement is the key word, and how to get them involved. One, one of the things is, is, is uh, new type of thinking. It's, it's a very difficult question. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, we, we stop here, this uh, session, and uh, we, uh, we pass to uh, the second uh, session. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to you. Uh, I have the pleasure of, of chairing this session on consequent management. Uh, this is, of course, a, a huge issue um, involving both technical cross-cutting, as we heard earlier from Engel Hansen, the importance of having cross-cutting um, competencies and navigating a, a minefield of, of different interests. Um, I'm often struck by the fact that the EU has a counter-terrorism strategy since 2005. Very few people know uh, what it looks like um, from the outside who are not dealing directly with the issue. Um, it is, of course, prevent, protect, pursue, response. Um, and, of course, um, it is a necessity to have an overarching strategy and this session really deals with both the soft end and the hard end. And I think it's often too easy to forget the soft end in the sense of public, um, um, uh, public information uh, in crisis situations. Um, I think that that is an incredibly important issue. Um, on a personal note, let me say that not only having joint up structures, but also having a well thought through crisis communication strategy is absolutely essential. And let me just mention two areas where I've seen this at work um, that illustrates the importance of that. The one is, of course, the London 2005 bombings, where they sang in unison in managing down, because what is the purpose of having an overall EU counterterrorism strategy? It is for individuals to walk in EU language with security, um, uh, with security, liberty, and freedom. And in response to your question earlier, I fear that in relation to civil liberties which we cherish within the European Union, an absolutely essential you know, issue is to, to prepare and to, to calm down public, um, public fears and, and, and alarms in relation to that. Because if there is a major incidence, I'm afraid uh, we'll have to struggle very hard uh, against trying to, to, of those that are pushing for in, in a secure state. And the consequences on individual member states, I think, will be, be quite severe. Um, the other issue of the importance of consequence management or having a, a public information, I, I take personally from, I discussed this with Nick Gowing, the BBC correspondent, who was on air when the Ryson affair happened in the UK. Uh, in that instance, there was no communication between BBC and the government, and therefore, of course, there was, uh, it was not joined up in relation to to the coordination between the media institutions on. I, I think we pay too little attention to the media crisis management uh, communities. Therefore, it is my pleasure to turn over the, the word to, uh, to uh, Arya Cohen. We'll talk about the, uh, the addressing by terrorism in Europe, development of a public information strategy. And then we'll hear from uh, Juha uh, Ratojavi from the Finnish uh, 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 Prediction Nuclear Advisory Board um, uh, from, from Finland, who will talk uh, uh, on, on related issues. Uh, I'll turn over the floor to you, uh, uh, Ariel, and we'll do for 15 minutes uh, presentation, and then we'll turn over uh, the floor to, to Juha, and then uh, we will have a Q&A session. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Timo Hellenberg whose picture you can see here on uh, the slide. He's very photogenic. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, in the 21st century, the line between information operations and hard edge operations is blurring. 
And for the adversary today, for those who develop the jihadi websites in Iraq or Afghanistan, or the website is essentially a, a global platform, for them, uh, the websites and the messages are just as important as the bombs, uh, the rockets, uh, the, the poisons, etc. They view it as what they call the jihad of the pen, uh, jihad al kalam uh, And uh, unfortunately, our military and security establishment, which is still uh, very much formed uh, by and within the 20th, 20th century, it still thinks a lot of times in the terms of uh, hard, expensive systems, tanks, aircraft, armored personnel carriers, uh, and aircraft carriers. So we need to make a conceptual uh, catch-up uh, game to play uh, to understand how important um, our communication strategies may be in uh, cases of CBRN attacks. And let's take the first uh, case study, um, uh, is, which is Madrid bombing, uh, April 2004. The government is still focused on ETA uh, and uh, provides uh, the uh, wrong information to the Spanish people uh, just before the elections and to the EU. As a result, uh, their misinformation uh, is exposed and they lose elections. For those of you who are politicians, you understand how important this kind of um, uh, flaw in communication strategy is. It cost uh, Aznar uh, power. Uh, the second example is London. As already Chairman mentioned, uh, it is a much more coherent communication strategy. Crisis messaging goes all the way from uh, the mayor, Ken Livingston, the Red Ken, all the way to the Queen. And she says, quote, they will not make us change our way of life. Um, we're not afraid. And the G8 leaders who were in Britain at the time, uh, there's a great picture of uh, them standing with Tony Blair shoulder to shoulder uh, with the Brits. Uh, so um, messages are important in a situation where people may be disorganized, disoriented, and afraid. And if you remember London in 2005, a lot of people didn't know what's going to happen. Are more attacks going to come? What is safe? What is not safe? Can we use a tube? Can we use a public transportation, et cetera, et cetera? So uh, to have a plan, what do you do in a situation like that by itself is maybe half battle won. Uh, the EU response, uh, luckily, uh, was not delayed. There's a crisis coordination agreements, information sharing, data retention directive, CBRN action plan. So at least on the bureaucratic uh, level, uh, the EU is moving along. There's policy development, European arrest warrants in January 2004. There's a list of priorities, crisis response remain, uh, but re crisis response remains resource poor. Uh, there's a lack of policy consensus, and there is a comp bureaucratic competition. Uh, never heard about that before, but in this particular case, um, it is indeed the case. Uh, next slide is the Finnish information structure for disaster response. Prime Minister on top, Minister of Defense, Minister of Interior, uh, and then down to municipalities, media, and first responders. A note of caution. Um, I just came back from the Herzliya conference in Israel. It's sort of a verkunde uh, for the Middle East. Uh, Anders Fogg's, uh, Fogg Rasmussen was there. Uh, Liam Fox was there, so it's a very well uh, attended conference. And the, the point the Israelis were making is that today the media environment is totally different than it used to be. It used to be there was a guy or two guys, a guy and a girl, with a camera and they're, they're shooting something on a celluloid film. It takes about 24 hours to send it back and to uh, air it via television or what have you. Today. A person can take out a, a BlackBerry or a cell phone, take a picture, email the file, uh, and the file will be on a website within half an hour. So the distinction between the official media 
and the people's media, popular media, is wiped out. You can get pictures. And imagine a CBRN attack when you get pictures, God forbid, people getting sick, dying, uh, people being, uh, responders being disoriented. We had a very nice Finnish uh, Finnair crew uh, that uh, responded very well, but guess what? The, this wasn't for real and they were prepared. In a real situation, if the people are not prepared, you can get a picture within half an hour on the internet going viral that um, uh, is not making any uh, favors to anybody. So you have to have people who are trained to counter with pictures that will demonstrate who is in charge, that they're responding, that people are safe. I'm not saying you have to uh, put wrong pictures or misleading pictures, but these pictures will be there pretty much real time, and uh, you have to be prepared. You have to have uh, the policy towards that. Uh, public information towards inclusive model is key element of crisis management. I suggest you read it in the paper. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, we were looking at three scenarios, not just the scenario you saw in the movie that was shown before, not just uh, a, uh, um, uh, an aircraft with the uh, outburst of uh, a virus or a, a toxin. Actually, for this particular exercise, I hate to say that toxin is preferable than a virus. Why? Because toxin can uh, attack a group of people, but it's not contagious. It's not going to spread. If it is a pathogen, it's much more dangerous, and we, we'll get to what I see as the main point from the public information point of view. And that is that if you have a situation where the aircraft lands safely, that it doesn't crash, the main challenge for responders is to contain it, and the main challenge for communicators is to prevent panic and communicate that somebody is in charge. There is enough competence, competence is a key word, enough competence to contain the outbreak or the chemical attack in the enclosed environment. If, on the other hand, the second scenario, the outbreak spreads beyond the aircraft, beyond the containment zone, beyond the airport, and goes national at this point, the scenario number two, then the whole national response has to be uh, engaged and the communication has to be uh, that we are handling the outbreak not just at the airport, not just with the aircraft, but nationally. And we are, with the national government, with the first responders, we are preventing it from spreading to Europe, and we're preventing it from spreading worldwide. Because if this is something really nasty, it can spread. And the worst case scenario, of course, is the outbreak that goes continental, goes to the global pandemic. There, you have a tremendous amount of challenges. First of all, you're not in the United States, which is a country of one or maybe two languages, English and Spanish. You are in, in, in a continent of 27 plus languages. Secondly, you don't have one big national, well-endowed Department of Homeland Security, um, what is it called, the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The, our first paper, the first paper, uh, Institute for Analysis of Global Security did was to provide the U.S. model uh, of response to CBRN uh, and compare it to, to the European um, model. Europe is still uh, a, a conglomeration of nation states, and every nation state has its own uh, assembly of, of bureaucratic responders. So this is the main uh, challenge, and this is also a huge communication challenge. Who is communicating if the epidemic goes continental? Who is communicating if the epidemic, God forbid, goes global? Uh, do we have a World Health Organization role? 
a UN role, uh, other transnational organizations that play a role? What is the relative, um, relative balance of power, if you want, between Helsinki and Brussels and between other national capitals and Brussels? Big question mark. Um, domestic public information campaign, the question is, who is a national HQ? Where is the war room like we have in the US? UK has one, Russia has one. Um, and how does that war room relate to Europe, to Brussels? Second issue, social media. It immediately goes on Facebook. It immediately goes on Twitter. Who do you have uh, that is going to be in charge of that? Who is going to formulate this, what is it, 130 character messages on something people never thought about? You have to have somebody, hopefully under the age of 30. Yeah, I'm not looking for that job. You have to have somebody who is already on Twitter, who knows social media, on Facebook, who understands how to use these tools. Otherwise, your government or your central European authority is not going to be credible. Why? Because social research, poll after poll, indicates that people 25 and younger trust themselves communicating in social media more than they trust uh, national television news or let alone something as archaic as a newspaper. Uh, my suggestion is it's better to prepare in advance. So consistency of messages, be it national, uh, be it natural disasters or other CBRN scenarios, not specifically a bioterrorism scenario. It can be, uh, again, you know, fantasizing about uh, horror scenarios, an explosion of a nuclear reactor or something like that. But it is very important that they're designated spokespeople, that you know who formulates the messages, that you know the channels of communications, you have the phone numbers and emails of the journalists, of the key journalists and television, et cetera, who are going to get these messages. You have people who are capable to answer questions, A, for the media, and B, for the public. You will have to have a phone bank, and that phone bank will go hot. It'll go all red the moment this news are coming out. Somebody needs to sit there, and in the language that is understandable for an ordinary citizen, can explain in the language of that citizen, be it in New Europe, Old Europe, Middle Europe, or whatever, explain what on earth is going on. Why are we closing schools? Why are we closing airports? Why are you not supposed to travel? People have vacation plans, and all of a sudden there's an outbreak. So for me, looking at that from the communications point of view, the worst case scenario is an outbreak, a big outbreak. To conclude, uh, the current public diplomacy cri crisis um, information structure uh, our structures are ad hoc. There are multiple players, flawed information flows, unclear roles and responsibilities. It needs a comprehensive messaging strategy, and responders need proper training in messaging and communication that keep the public calm, informed, and constructively involved. You will need thousands and thousands of volunteers to come to help the government if and when, God forbid, this situation happens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we may want to, to just switch over the slides to the next uh, before we close down the system. Um, thank you, Ariel, for, for uh, that. Um, I would say it was a rather optimistic uh, projection because, um, I mean, even looking at conventional uh, terrorist attacks, um, one thing that national governments are relatively good at is, is handling the national press. Uh, they have no idea uh, what the vortex that they will happen when you have a major incident of this kind, of the world's media descending on you uh, and you having to respond uh, in real time. Um, let me just say that you know this is a huge challenge for those governments who have not faced the terrorism incidents of the conventional kind, uh, let alone uh, you know a, a nightmare scenario of this kind. So it's, I think it's important to think through. Um, and on another different level, I mean, I think the the illustration of how 
underprepared we are is uh, our response in relation to what is happening in, in the Middle East at the moment. With uh, how many EU communication officers are there who speaks Arabic, who are appearing on you know, Al Jazeera, who are communicating all these issues? I think this is an area that deserves a lot more attention, conventional, unconventional terms. We now turn to, to uh, we have had time to switch presentations. Uh, we now turn to Juha Rautjavi, Senior Research F uh, Fellow at the Finnish Radiological and Nuclear Safety Authority. Um, who will address the threat of nuclear radiological terrorism to air transport. Yeah, you know, let me start with uh, uh, with some picture which was drawn of a ten-year-old boy. Uh, we were we had uh, been engaged in the study, and we did some brief look to the to the literature uh, about uh, terrorism and uh, against aviation, and we were preparing ourselves for the first workshop before we then uh, moved into the interviewing the security operatives in Finland and then uh, completing our, our research work. And I would first let you share with me this perception of a 10-year-old boy which did not know anything about our work, but just I, I asked him to uh, share with me his understanding what our problem is. And I told it's about a terrorist attack. <clears throat> you see, there are four key elements. Top on the left, there is a kind of command and control. Some kind of monitoring instrumentation appears good, but there are letters Z, 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 indicating the state of awareness looks like being awake but is sleeping <laughs> on the right corner here is something on the ground observing something which is directing attention some indicator and there is a finnish word varoka be careful and he is very active in in character and someone is here walking above and saying, yeah. <laughs> I think it, it might be a terrorist yeah, I think it's the government. <laughs> or, or insider threat. I don't know who, but this was the way how he perceived our problem. Now that to be put on side, we have a movie afterwards, which is more, uh, more uh, uh, perhaps informative. Now, uh, first, we needed also to understand what the, what the problem we are facing. I'm representing the regulatory authority, and we are very well prepared during the past 30 years to uh, manage consequences and to manage the crisis situation caused by reactor accidents and, and such, uh, such situations. But this appeared to be, for us, a new challenge to see and to see uh, what uh, is the challenge to us and how to address it. We decided to, to go and interview uh, the key oper security operatives at different institutions, including, uh, our, of course, our own uh, uh, operatives. In the, in the airport industry, rescue services, Finnair police, uh, security police, and defense uh, representatives, and to see how the 
security operatives in Finland uh, share the, uh, the concerns and how these concepts which has been uh, discussed here and which are in, in uh, different action plans and in different re resolutions and so on, how all that message has penetrated into the daily work and routines of the security operatives. So we understood that, uh, uh, like mentioned earlier, we shall not just count on lessons learned from past experiences. The, those who are actively trying to create harm, they are not necessarily uh, following that line of thought, but they are just searching for opportunities. And opportunities which our uh, security systems and our security environment offers to them. So, definitely the threat is to be perceived as evolving and something creative which is always offering us new challenges. And uh, uh, the question which here uh, was asked uh, uh, by Magnus earlier, uh, or he pointed out that this has not happened yet. The CBRN materials have not been used uh, massively uh, in connection with uh, terrorist attacks. We found, uh, we consider that uh, there may be some, uh, some reasons which were already partly at least referred earlier. Uh, that CBN materials are so well accounted for, controlled and protected, that there is a difficult to have access to those. Insiders, operators, support and service personnel are loyal to the institutions. So insiders are not helping organized crime or any other sources to get access to materials. Security systems serve the purposes and operatives functions efficiently. And then about the people who are contemplating to conduct the act of terror are not conversant with CBN materials. They are not comfortable with those materials. And also their supporters may not appreciate if they touch these kind of materials. Uh, we oriented ourselves to, uh, to do a kind of reality check in respect to, to the extent possible for us, relating to these questions. And my profession is in, in the area of accounting and control of and protection of, of uh, radiological and nuclear materials. And my professional uh, experience suggests that we must accept, we must be aware and accept that these materials are not yet adequately accounted for, controlled and protected. There is enough material for that kind of use. And the other concern is that loyalty is holding the sway over the institutions, organizations and operations within the predominant culture of uh, secrecy in the, for example, during the Cold War time. This must have somehow protected us, these loyalties. And this I have discussed with, uh, with my uh, Russian colleagues, and they share the concern that the changes in this kind of culture of secrecy to so-called culture of security, or whatever we may call it, this transition is a very, very risky time. These loyalties are not anymore there. Protecting us to that extent may have happened. Then security systems has been tested and has been proven through exercises and so on, and they are proven to function, but they need not to serve the purpose in case when something else happens. So we have to change our strategies in, in uh, preparing ourselves. We have to get the security systems evolving also, and we have to, uh, in, in that area, something um, concrete must be done and can be done. 
then there are thousands of people which are today on the street which has a knowledge about those materials and are comfortable with use of those materials and are living under conditions that they do not have perspective and if organized crime and any such incentives are offering them an opportunities there there is a, that kind of knowledge capital uh, to get hired so also i think that is uh, is an important element which uh, have to be addressed to keep these uh, capacities and competencies uh, on our side so to say so the risk is there I share, share the view of the previous ones that this may one day, we may one day face that. But of course, we have to be prepared now not to wait for that incident or accident or catastrophe, but rather now to put up, like mentioned here, <coughs> proactive, proactively start investing on improving and implementing those measures and those actions which we have on our action plans. So it was already mentioned that from the reactive approaches, which we, we may well be now uh, uh, be focused on, we have to be more proactive. And how to be more proactive, the question from the audience here was uh, to, the, to the other end of the, of the solution, possible solution, we have to see the whole whole problem from the beginning till end of it and start really intensively working on all, all aspects of, of the problem. We, we learned that uh, we have in, uh, our understanding is that we have invested during the past 10 years or 20 years very much on, on monitoring, uh, on stati stationary monitoring uh, uh, of the of the uh, transport of goods and uh, monitoring of people using radiation monitors gate monitors and uh, domodeyeva is a good example how vulnerable we are if we are just dependent on on stationary uh, uh, systems we must have some kind of complementary mobile presence, mobile instrumentation, and some kind of, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, we need to have a, also real-time uh, real support for those field operations so that they will get immediate uh, feedback information uh, about the detection, what has been detected at the border, so that the traffic people can move free without being uh, being uh, investigated as, uh, as a criminal investigation cases. So I would suggest that uh, I just, uh, I have to, uh, uh, our main, <laughs> we started with the figures and uh, we ended with the figures. Uh, this is uh, an outline of a methodology where which we are thinking how the evolving threat uh, could be conceptually perceived and monitored, and then decision making could be uh, could be identified, and how the security must be evolving also uh, alongside. But this uh, cannot be uh, more addressed here. I have to go to the conclusions. But uh, you see those elaborated in our our uh, second paper. This is about what we are going to do in our organization. And we continue working to develop further our practices. And uh, we have also, as a, as a kick-off from here, we are considering additional projects, uh, one having to do to enhance further the helsinki Vanta airport uh, capacities. The fast train connection between Helsinki and St. Petersburg started to operate in December. 
it's an open question how to protect that from these uh, risks. And we need to, we need to really uh, invest on these uh, mobile concepts and mobile uh, capacity and, uh, and, and support, uh, uh, support systems to uh, provide the analytical support and this, uh, support to the decision makers. And the last point, of course, is the, is the communication information technology, not only to support uh, decision making and, uh, and expert work, but uh, particularly also to be integrated to public information processes. So there's a lot to, there's a lot to do. I would suggest that 10 more years, $10 billion uh, G, uh, global partnership, they must next year decide to, to make the same, same investment and same effort further. We are, we are just in the beginning of of uh, taking care of security. Thank you very much. That was a smorgasbord of challenges. We need some cheering up, I think, so setting the, the, the bar high in order to, uh, to, to address some of these issues. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, there are lots of different issues involved in all of this, um, not at least to say the importance of keeping uh, society calm or avoiding undue fear of managing a, a huge crisis of this scale. There's also still a lack of, uh, th you know, real understanding on threat convergence, of understanding the, the intention of the actors. But I, I guess what Magnus pointed out earlier is the disincentives, you know, not just, not just what, what drives them, what they say what they want to do. And I can say that, you know, one thing I took away from the security environment over the last four months was a conversation I had with a quite a senior intelligence figure in, 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 uh, uh, from the US who said in relation to the threat levels going up and down and publics weren't knowing what they were, you know, what was happening, nothing happened, nothing materialized. Um, we tried to, you know, adopt the British approach of being alert but not alarmed. Um, what he said to me was, you know, struggling with all these different complexities of uncertainty um, in the age of globalization, he said, what keeps me up at night is not what we know, but what we don't know in terms of the scale of the issues. And I think, you know, we are at serious risk, and I'm saying this you know, from my end, I don't understand the technical aspects, but I certainly understand the adversary, that we have the risk of being blindsided. And we need to, we need to be true to the blueprint of the EU counterterrorism strategy, and here is an area where you have very much direct cross-cutting uh, capabilities in, in, in thinking through. This is not just a blueprint on paper. This is a blueprint that needs, uh, there is a, a logic, and, and that logic is to, to manage down technically, but also in terms of public information to the society. Now, in that vein, let me, um, I, I'm not, unless there's an urgent question, I want to turn it over to Timo Hellenberg, because uh, I know we are struggling slightly behind time uh, to, to show you a visual aspect of, uh, of the project, uh, which, uh, which uh, I think you will do for about uh, five minutes, and then we go into the final session. There is a, yeah, and, and perhaps may I suggest it's the interest of time that you may want to, to open up the floor during the last session uh, to ask questions to any of the, the, the previous uh, panels uh, if you've been thinking and absorbing the. So, so Timo, please, uh, if you want to show, uh, visualize um, the project, um, and, and I leave that. I leave that to you. Okay. All right. I've, I'm told it takes just a few minutes. You may want to ask questions to to this panel or to any of the previous ones. So, please, uh, in the back, you had a question. I hope they haven't left. Yes. My, my, name, my name is Ivan Sorens, and I'm responsible for land transport security. So security, not safety, for land transport in the Transport Department of the European Commission. Let me start off first by saying we appreciate uh, not just that our colleagues are sponsoring the event, but also for the European Parliament to open up so we can have these desensitize and start being practical on uh, addressing this issue, which is certainly of a concern also for us. We know many of the gaps, most people do. You say there are differences, yes, we also know that. But with your experiences, when you're finalizing your report, 
do your best experiences. How do we overcome the gaps? What are those steps that we can do to take over, to learn from this exercise and not just saying, okay, there's a difference. How do we overcome the barrier between the prime minister's offices and defense? Maybe also consider looking for not just top down, but also bottom up. If in the old days you had one hour to react to a crisis, you may have, uh, if you're dealing with CBIN, you may have 10 minutes. One thing you have, I think all of you neglected, is really the transport link. You have also, uh, a question to you will also be, uh, why, why, why do you choose aviation? Why don't you choose a, a, a metro system? Where, or the, what do you do with the airport, with the people leaving uh, the situation? If the, everybody's leaving the airport, how are you going to get your emergency people in? A cultural challenge as well. You were talking first responses or police and military, prime minister's office, everybody who are used to exercises. When you're dealing with the civil side of transport, they don't have the same military, police, ambulance, uh, culture of exercising and regimes. Very often it's much more complicated because who is really in charge? Uh, so, so that will be maybe to expand your studies or next studies to take that next steps where it starts getting really complicated. Communication, what do you do if you have to close down a train or a railway station with police coming? Do you have policemen to communicate to all this? No, you don't. You have to work with the transport companies. Small example, and as I come back to the question, sorry for abusing the time. In uh, Copenhagen, when they uh, prepared for the security of COP15, uh, COP they asked the chief of security how fast he can eva uh, evacuate a hall with 10,000 people. And then he started counting how many police cars and motorcycles he has, and he came up, well, after some days. So, so if you want to react to a CBIN crisis, either if because you don't want it to spread or you need to move people, how can you do these things if you're not cooperating with the transport sector or taking them all so that you can move people or can stop the movement? And that would be a communication tool. So uh, with that one, uh, again, thanks for the European Parliament for this. And I really hope your final report will not just list the gaps, but really with your very variable experience put in what is the following next step, what is, how can we overcome these gaps? Don't just list them as everybody else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, suggestions for the final report. Maybe also the final panel want to, to take a stab at that, uh, that uh, issue. I'll leave that open. I'll now turn over to Timo for his video. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, so this is the video <clears throat> we produced within the project. It's a combination of uh, uh, threat scenario to describe how the scenario develops and then uh, there is short video description also about the actual exercise. So we have combined these two just to demonstrate what type of uh, threat uh, is in concern. I regret that we have some difficulties with, uh, with the loudspeakers but I, let's see how it works out. Thank you.
So this is uh, taken from the actual exercise in the in the inside of the plane, and of course uh, uh, we used uh, some uh, actors to demonstrate the uh, passengers. They were all volunteers, and uh, the Finnair cabin crew played the essential role. And uh, these symptoms in the actual threat scenario appear when the plane is in the air or, or in, in the Russian airspace and few of the passengers start feeling sick. And uh, so this is the uh, response by the uh, cabin crew, first measures, and then uh, the next stage is when the plane lands and, and all the activities taking place at the airport. Approximately uh, 200 people were involved in the planning and, uh, and conducting and uh, implementing uh, this exercise as a whole, the tabletop exercise and then the uh, live exercise. Uh, but uh, I think uh, in order to save time, uh, what I can promise is that all the uh, participants of this conference will receive two things afterwards. The final publication, which is about 300 pages, and then uh, the DVD of the uh, actual exercise. So would that be okay, Mr. Chairman? Okay. Good. Thank you, Dima. It's time to conclude our uh, seminar. Uh, there are four person speakers left and for the beginning i want to thank all all for the interesting presentations and opinions and let me re repeat once again as it has already been said today in past 10 years there are, there have been serious attacks by the terrorists starting from 9/11 in 2001 Madrid in April 2004, London in July 2005, and now the latest Moscow airport two weeks ago. These attacks are all related to transport, planes, metros and airports. As a member of Committee of Transport and Tourism, I know what influence those attacks have, be, have to both of them, to transport and to tour tourism. Since now, those attacks have been a kind of classic, classical hijacking and bombs, but we really need to think what, uh, about what if those would have been also CBRN related. What would have been the consequences then? How many people would have been affected? Those are just a few of the questions what are related for the, such a very serious issue as a transport security. And as a legislative body, European Parliament must to answer these questions. And therefore, it's very important to get info, any information from specialists. And I am very pleased to, to host today's uh, seminar. And now, just uh, to closing our seminar, I give the floor for the final speakers. And firstly, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Apo Sederberg, who is the Secretary General of the Security and Defence Committee in Ministry of Defence in Finland. Please, Mr. Sederberg, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for inviting me here. And, and it's a great uh, privilege to, to address this, uh, this audience. Um, although the points I, I was considering to make to, today, they have been all, already made. So I, I thank all the previous speakers and the presentations because all, all the ideas were in those presentations. But perhaps I could focus on three areas in order to be able to underline some, some issues. And actually, uh, the perspective of, of Security and Defense Committee on this project have been, been um, on strategic level. So we have been looking this um, through our, our strategy. And actually, I'm happy to inform you that, uh, that the Finnish government um, adopted the new strategy, the strategy for, for the Finnish, uh, the security strategy for the Finnish society last December. And actually, wh what is new in the strategy, there is re really a couple of elements which actually we can find also uh, from this, uh, uh, this, this project. Firstly, of course, um, the comprehensive security approach. The security matters. They, 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 they are matters for the whole society. It's not only the authorities. You have to be able to involve the whole society. And like in these complex situations, which, which we have here one example, it demonstrates us that, that, that we have to really be able to utilize all the expertise we have in the society. And, and that's one of the fundamental changes also in, in the Finnish society, that, that more and more of the critical infrastructure is actually owned by the private sector, and they are also running it. And also the expertise we need <coughs> in security matters, uh, it's, it's on, on their side. So private-public partnership, it's coming more and more fundamental element of the security. At the same time, have to be said that the authorities, we can't outsource the security issues, but we have to work together and, and we, we have, be, be, have to be a, a, a able to develop the, the comprehensive co concept um, uh, of, of, the, of the society. And not only, only the bis business community, also the, the voluntary organizations NGOs, they have to be involved, and we have been, been involving them in our strategy. They have been a part of the planning team, and, and actually now when we start to imp implement the strategy, so we hope that they are really taking uh, uh, some elements uh, and, and, and uh, more actively coming and, and working together with all the authorities. In the strategy, we have actually uh, described uh, the threat models of the Finnish society. And if I look at the threat models, now we have 13 threat models in, in the strategy. One of them is, is uh, problems uh, and crisis in our uh, logistic chain and transportation. So actually, it's, 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 it's really um, directly um, linked to this ether scenario where we have now been tackling the, the uh, uh, air transportation system and the problems on that side. And the other one which can be pointed out is, of course, terrorism. How we are, we, we are, we are handling different kinds of terrorist issues. So really, when we are looking at the findings of this pro project, so we can uh, and, and we will evaluate them in order to look the changes in the society and in, in also in order to, to figure out some new challenges in our, our security systems. Well, there was actually one question, uh, uh, how, how to overcome the gaps? So, so how to overcome the gaps? One of the findings, are of course, that it's not uh, uh, the, the new type of crisis uh, uh, and especially asymmetric crisis, they are not only a question of one country, they are a question of, of the whole Europe. So my, my proposal is that, that Finland has now made a very good uh, security strategy, a comprehensive one. So why, why don't we have one in EU? 
So, so if we are looking to EU regulation, it, it, it's uh, bits and pieces. We have uh, different strategies, but not a comprehensive one. So, so actually, I'm offering uh, the Finnish model to the EU in order to be able to to uh, to face the new new challenges. And my third point is actually going to the terrorism, terrorism and, and um, how to, to prepare for the terrorist attacks. And I agree what was said here uh, before that, um, that the, somehow we have a feeling and, and we, we have to, uh, to, um, we, we have to agree that uh, or we have, have to admit, that in, in some, some areas they are ahead of us. And how to face, we have been talking about the situational awareness, which is of course a key ele element in many ways, and we should uh, figure out early morning signals in, in order to be able to, to prevent the ten terrorist attacks. But, but that's, we have been saying this for, 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 for a long time. Now we have to find new ways and means, and 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 I think one aspect actually which I took and and um, and Ariel Cohen also underlined is is the communication strategy. So 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 this is this is also a preventive mean. We we have to understand that uh, that that we we can do a lot in in that field. And actually, uh, if we want to prevent from the Finnish point of view. We have to give a signal to the terrorists that it's, it's not too easy to come to Finland and, and make a ter terrorist attacks in, in a way that our cri crisis resilience system is so effective and we have the agility and, and, and we, we have pre been preparing on all, all, all different scenarios that they feel that it, it's not too easy. <coughs> this is, of, of course, um, uh, one, one, one element. The second um, solution which I'm offering, of course, figuring out now we shouldn't look too much uh, to the past. We have to look to the future and what are the new way ways of, of terrorism. Perhaps uh, CBR threats is one possibility. Then we have a growing, growing sector, this cyber uh, threats. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the, because they are much, much easier to use, and, and, and there are a lot, a, lot, a lot of positive elements looking from the ter terrorist angle in that, so perhaps that's something we, we have to find, and, and there might be others which we have to figure out. But uh, that's uh, just to start with, and, and um, uh, my final point co goes that uh, we, we thank um, uh, the, this ether uh, project. It has been very, very good for us. It has been, been one, one element uh, in, in our strategic planning to, to look at the changes in our security environment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sederberg. And uh, now I want to give the floor to Mr. Timo Herkonen, Director of Government Security in Prime Minister's Office of Finland. Please, floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. I could continue from where Apple stopped and continue with, continue with thanking everyone. Uh, the previous speakers and uh, previous remarks made in this conference. I fully agree with those, and especially with those made by my former boss, Mr. Mr. Risto Volanen, and my good colleague from EU side, Mr. Johnny Engelhansen. We have had, had long discussions, and we have discussed a lot of these challenges we have had, and we still have in front of us. But uh, I will not be uh, that brief, I, because I have a couple of things I like to emphasize. Uh, yes, I will be brief, but not as brief as I could, so that's good to continue to the next speaker. But a couple of things I'd like to emphasize. And one, of course, and these remarks are from the uh, point of view of Prime Minister's office, which I'm representing, representing here. And from that point of view, I think the most important uh, function in this exercise and also in real life is the, the thing called situational awareness. Not only the information flow, information sharing, but also uh, early warning, early warning systems, and also we could uh, look even more further and speak about horizon scanning, because all of that is also very important for the political decision makers and decision makers in government level to be ready 
to child uh, to to have uh, to 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 be to to to, to be ready to uh, any any kind of crisis which could be ahead of us. Uh, in Finland, I think a uh, good uh, tool for the information sharing and situation awareness of the state, state leadership is our government situation center, which we uh, built up a couple of years ago with good cooperation with the Ministry of Interior and uh, Security Police. Prime Minister of Office is running that center, and the personnel is provided by the Finnish Security Police and Ministry of Interior. So thank you for that. It has been very helpful and very, very good experience for us. The Government Situation Center in Finland acts also as a single national point of contact for quite many EU bodies and EU systems. For example, the CCA, which were described by Johnny here, crisis coordination arrangement, and also on operational level, uh, Commission side, we have Monetary Information Center and its uh, activities, so the National Government Citizen Center is our national point of contact in that, and many, many other, uh, other EU bodies as well. And from point of view of a small member state, I could say that, uh, and when I go to the Citizen Center, I look all the uh, things they have on their table, all the systems they have towards the EU. I think we have several information sharing systems. I think we have uh, uh, too many information sharing systems. Uh, I think the, uh, if we could combine those and uh, uh, use them in more effective way, that could be uh, more helpful for the member states and also for uh, the EU itself. Uh, Information sharing between EU bodies, for example, the citizen is very important, but also uh, information sharing between the member states. I'd like to emphasize that. Uh, not only on EU level, but also on bilateral level, regional level. We have had good experiences of that with, the, for example, with our Swedish colleagues, and uh, now we are uh, also, having in that circle, we, had, we will have Norway and Denmark with us in the near future, and hope that also the, our neighbor on the other side of the Finnish Gulf could join us in some time in the near future in that. And uh, also, like to have that as an example in EU level. So, in early stages of any kind of crisis, information sharing between member states already in the early stages, I could encourage the member states to do that, and also EU in coordinating that it uh, has its own big role in that. Because, as I said, situation awareness is very important for the decision making, even if the crisis is not that big enough that it is political. Also, in those a smaller scale of crisis, the political decision makers they need to know what is happening and what the authorities are doing. The authorities, authorities, of course, they are handling the situation. They take care of the crisis management on a field level. But the decision makers, they need to know what is, has happened there. Because nowadays, prime minister or, or any other minister, when he comes uh, from some, uh, out from the meeting room, he or she can face a TV camera and microphone and a reporter who will ask what has happened there and what are the authorities doing there. So it's fair enough that the decision maker, the politician, uh, already knows the situation on the ground and could uh, give an answer. Answer being like, I know what is there and I, 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 I think that the, our authorities, they are doing their best and they will handle the situation quite well. That leads my, to the, my next point, which is, of course, the communication, which is have already spoken here by many speakers. It's very important nowadays. Of course, the authorities who have the responsibility on the crisis management, they also are responsible for the communication of that situation. We have spoken about the social media, so the citizens are speaking of, of that, what has happened, or what, or what is the crisis about. But I still think that in some states and in quite early states, also the political decision makers have to come in front 
of TV cameras and tell their opinions and uh, tell what they think about that and what is the situation of, of their point of view. Just to give a face to the crisis or just to give some uh, to, to the public uh, the information they need. So uh, <coughs> not only the authorities, not only the citizens, but the political leaders. Uh, and in most cases and most crises, that is the, that is enough for the politicians what they, what, how they can involve in that crisis. For example, in Finland we have a couple of school shootings. Those were handled by, of course, the authorities, but in very early states, in both cases, Prime Minister himself gave a press conference and information for the citizens what has happened there. That's very good and very, very important, important, important to do. Fourth thing, I think, uh, and one of the uh, key elements in crisis management and handling the crisis is, of course, uh, the planning of uh, how, what to do, but also to train and exercise. We have been speaking about the exercises, but uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of the exercises. Uh, exercises on every level, so on the level of the authorities, level of the ministries, and also on the level of the state leadership. That's very important, the exercise. And not only the exercise, but also train. And that, that is something we need to improve in our systems, to how to train the uh, high decision makers on political level or, or, or ministerial level. We have exercises, but in the exercises we assume that the uh, leaders know what to do. But I think that if they have been trained before the exercise, uh, it could be more useful and have more, more training, and then after that, the exercises. I think that is the concept we are going on in the future. And in the exercises, uh, we have, have used the exercise between the authorities, between the ministries, and also the government level. But the, in the future, we need also other participants in the exercises, and I encourage also to take the uh, other specialists from uh, academic world, from private sector, and also from non-governmental non organizations involved in these exercises, also, also in addition to the authorities. I think that is something uh, which needs to also to be improved, improved in our systems. Exercises on national level, exercises government uh, on bilateral exercises between the neighbors, neighboring countries, and also CCA, I mean the EU-led exercises like CCA, CCA exercises has been, had been. So uh, that is something we need to do in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hergonen. And the next speaker is Mr. Lars Nikander. I hope I spelled this correctly, your name, who is a director of the Center of Asymmetric Studies at Swedish National Defense College. Yours. Uh, yours, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to give some reflections uh, from the non-Finnish panelists here. Uh, and as the head of research efforts within this uh, project, uh, firstly of all, if you sit back a little bit, you can see that this project became much more timely than we thought. With this, uh, this kind of issue, CBAR and terrorism and aviation security, as this has become a key part of the EU-US dialogue in this respect. If I just have some notes here, one thing that struck me after a while, that we chose the wrong airport when we started, had this project with Hong Kong Airport. That's the most safest airport in the world. <laughs> so the, 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 we could maybe have chosen the Russian airport. But, uh, uh, in, but anyway, that, that's a benchmark for everyone else. I just want to say that's an experience from our Hong Kong trip when we visited that. So, so um, with, with that in mind, uh, that, that was just the detail. But uh, it, that's an important uh, thing to mention also here, that you can, you can deal with this in a structured uh, fashion. Um, what, what some experience here is that what's general, if you're looking first on the threat side, 
is uh, information sharing, information exchange on the threat side. And we all, all countries are, are suffering with this Cold War heritage. Going from the paradigm shift, need to know to need to share. How do you deal with that? Because in the Cold War terms, you shouldn't, uh, which was counterintelligence, you shouldn't talk to anyone. In the CT world, you should talk to everyone, almost. But to, to, to change that shift and to get the lines of communications uh, updated with that, that's still uh, uh, much to do there. And of all these kind of exercises, what we see here and the experience is that it stresses the need to connect the threat world with operational world. Because what does it matter if you have how the, the, the threat people and intelligence service know what happened, but they don't have the budget to fix the problems? And the, the organizations which have the money and the budget resources for this doesn't know what the threat looks like. And we must be more better in getting uh, those two worlds together. And the means for that is these kinds of exercises. And um, we, um, the, this, uh, that, that's the most valuable thing with this. CBR is one area, cyber defense is another, cyber security is another area. We had one in the Baltic, uh, with Estonia, Baltic Cyber Shield last uh, uh, year, which is also uh, very important. And when it comes to exercise, I will uh, agree with Tima Harkinen here. Maybe we shouldn't look so much on testing exercises, more on learning exercises. You must be allowed to fail, otherwise you won't learn. One problem with uh, government uh, exercises, at least in the Swedish context, has been when it was not so dangerous anymore after the Cold War, political appointees didn't want to participate because uh, the civil servant could uh, see them in a bad light. So they tried to disappear, and it, you never knew, knew how they would react. And it came a change when we had the, the first, ex, uh, pro, the previous project, Poseidon here, when uh, together with Finland and Sweden, and when our prime minister ordered the cabinet minister to sit in. You're, uh, uh, it's compulsory. You can't uh, uh, fade away. I think th that is. Um, um, an important feature. You must have the key players there, otherwise uh, a dry run in a very dry sense. I think the, the coordination, we, we all have our own crosses to bear nationally with the, the odd constitutions. And uh, I think the, what meant, I think it was you are here earlier, and, uh, t uh, describe the Finnish system and others, that it should be solved the problems at the lowest possible level, subsidiary principle, which is quite a uh, common word here in the European Union. But um, it's also no went to, to how to ele elevate it. I think w the UK model with the bronze, silver and gold system is, is uh, very attractive, but it's, uh, of course it must be adapted to every country. Um, and um, also when it's come to the European level, how to coordinate, I think the uh, Commission Malmström's uh, work development of the internal security strategy is an important step, but it must be added on with lots of other components here in a structured fashion. So uh, with that, I think I stop my comments here and just want to add my uh, Big thanks and, uh, to, to Timo Hellenberg for his uh, good work, and I hope uh, uh, this will uh, leave some lasting re uh, remarks in, uh, in the history books. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker today is Mrs. Ritva Viljanen, Secretary General of Finnish Ministry of Interior. I'm glad to give the floor to you, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank, thank you for giving me this opportunity. This is a very Nordic pa panel here now, and um, uh, uh, Nordic Baltic, <laughs> but these are cousins fr from Estonia. Uh, 
uh, in early 2000, the science, when, when the internet uh, became global and it was very intensively used, uh, future scientists, scientist, they uh, said that now the world is so global that every big phenomenon, every trend can happen in every country, but in, but in some years delay, four or five years delay. When we heard this in, in Finland, in peaceful Finland, we thought that this is a nonsense, uh, not in Finland. And then, 2007, we had the first school shootings, 2008, the second school shootings. Uh, the world has really changed. For, for, uh, for instance, uh, Yulan Post, uh, uh, Muhammad cartoons uh, demonstrate a big phenomenon in global globally. But I, I say uh, that if we look at our pay newspapers 10 years back, we can see ex uh, exactly the same Muhammad pictures and nothing happens. But now, nowadays it's a big, uh, big phenomenon. We can see that the terrorist attacks, they are, uh, they are coming up to no Norden and up to Finland, up to Nordic countries, up, up to Baltic countries nowadays. Uh, for 11th day, day of December last year, we had in Stockholm a suicide bombing attack. It was very complex because it was a, it was a lonely wolf, soft place, hard, hard to con control because it happened in the heart of a Stockholm, in shop, shopping center area. Uh, <coughs> motivation, uh, motiva it was motivated by Al-Qaeda and uh, the idea was uh, to get uh, so big mass murder as possible. So this is a very hard situation to civil servants. My biggest idea is, uh, as uh, Juha uh, Rautjärvi said, that not only wait, prevent. Not only wait that something happens, prevent, prevent it. And, uh, I think that this is uh, something what we must do in every country in the European Union, because uh, we can see that people in our inside in our country become radicalized. Uh, and uh, in the same time, when the recession came and our economical situation hardens, uh, hardened it, our, also our attitudes has hard, hardened it. And uh, when we have looked uh, what, what is the phenomenon? Why you are, why you are become radicalized? Uh, we can see that uh, a big phenomenon behind it is that you you are always feeling outsider in a, in that society. We are, you are all the time early, early uh, migrant people. Uh, you are unemployed or underemployed. You are social excluded, and you are active. Recruited, recruited, and you find your 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 own group, for instance, from internet, and you uh, train yourself. So, uh, to integrate uh, integrate people in a good way into our society, to avoid social exclusion, uh, to be care of, uh, but in in the media, our key persons put don't put people towards each other. This is very impo important. Risto Volanen said that in, in nowadays uh, crisis we need uh, uh, political and operational uh, leadership. Yes, but I would like to add to that also administrational leadership. In the same time, we have a, as, you, as you have heard that we have a very strong tradition in Finland but in, in the local level uh, in operational level, we, have, we, have, we, have fun, uh, we work very effectively. But we need, in the same time, administrational uh, leadership, legislation, social aid, information sharing, uh, taking contacts to European commu uh, communities, and in the same time, political, political leadership. When these school shootings happened in Finland, if we haven't had uh, next morning, in every schools in Finland, but uh, the teachers they uh, discussed what has happened in that uh, Jokela school. Uh, it, it was so good to our children. 
my, my daughter was in school in that day, uh, that time still, and I could show that, uh, uh, that it was very good for her that uh, with uh, his uh, teacher they had this uh, information, information morning situation, situations. Uh, I really liked this, uh, uh, this Herschel's uh, conclusion about this situation awareness. I think that it's a very good word. Uh, we have situation picture, but situation awareness is something else. It's uh, broader, it's, uh, it's on, online, and um, it reminds us uh, about these issues. Because I come from a Ministry of Interior from Finland, in our task field and in our ministry, we take care of internal security, but also immigration situation all, all the, uh, in the same time. And uh, <clears throat> I, I say, I say that uh, this, this immigra uh, immigration line, the sector, those who are working with immigrant people, daily basis, they, are, they have very good situation awareness. We call them in our press, our press call them that they are so-called flower hat ladies, because they are social and they are taking care of integration. But they are very separate, uh, separate groups from internal security groups, uh, police, rescue, border guards. And uh, I think that we, are, we must do something, dialogue between these two lines, because maybe it can be, uh, can be so that these flower hat ladies <coughs> have better situation awareness than the internal security sector in our society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. William. And, and now we are left a uh, couple minutes uh, for questions. If there are some minute interventions or questions, please. <coughs> okay. So, let me thank you all for your presentations, speeches, interventions, and questions. And I hope that we all got some useful and fruitful information that uh, we will continue to work together and find the solution to the serious problem. And especially, I would like to thank Mr. Timo Hellenberg and, <laughs> and his team, Pekka Eskola and Anne-Marie Turpuinen, for the great effort of organization of such events, this event, and of course, my dear colleague, Anneli and Maggie. And now, I would like to ask you all to the drinks and snacks just left on the, behind the doors. Thank you very much and Thank you. see you next time.